This video contains dragons, lots of dragons, and a wizard. The word syphilis is mentioned in passing for no good reason. That's just how the wizard rolls. There's some truly horrendous musicianship and singing because I haven't practiced for about six years and needed to bash this out quickly. All is not well in the island of Linearis Modellus. For years, humans and dragons have lived in harmony until recently. The rulers of the 134 kingdoms want the island for themselves. Through a campaign of propaganda, they have convinced their subjects that the dragons should be banished. They have sent their best knights to slay the dragons. Only Melvin, a wise wizard of statistics, can save them. He meets with the commander-in-chief of the knights of the 134 kingdoms. Hello, 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 hello. And who am I addressing? I am Zach Field, uh, of the defender of the world of military. Oh, I see, I see, I see. The world of military, the most hostile and aggressive of all the kingdoms. Why have you come here? Kill all the dragons, thank you. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. But dragons are nice. Why would you want to kill them? Because they eat all your sheep. Because their dung doesn't help their crops to grow. Because they kidnap the princesses. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, that all sounds a bit old-fashioned, kidnapping princesses. I'm sure they kidnap princes as well these days, you know. They only kidnap princesses. Anyway, anyway, what to do, what to do? I best talk to the dragons to see what they have to say. Hey, can you help me? Can you stop Step from killing the dragons? Well, I'll jolly well see what I can do. Well, 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 the knight seemed to have a lot of data on which he was basing his conclusions about dragons. And it looked to me like all of those data he'd fitted a linear model to. Now we know all about linear models because we have been studying them for many lectures already. But the thing we haven't looked at yet, we've looked at sampling, we've looked at fitting models, we've looked at estimating parameters, we've looked at hypothesis testing. But we haven't looked at testing the assumptions of our models to see whether they are broken. So I am wondering if maybe we should look a bit closer at the knight's models. Now before we do that, let's have a little recap of the general linear model. Now we have seen that the general linear model is a broad framework for trying to predict outcomes from variables or predictors. And when we fit this model, we're trying to predict the value of an outcome variable and we're trying to do it based on one or more predictor variables. And each predictor variable has a little b attached to it and this is known as a parameter. And what we try to do is estimate the values of these b's or parameters and in combination with values of the predictors, this allows us to predict a value of an outcome variable. Now the b's or the parameters attached to the predictor variables, they are estimates of the uh, relationship between the predictor and the outcome. And we also have a parameter that tells us the value of the outcome when all of the predictors are zero. We've looked before at how we could predict ear ringing based on the volume of a concert. And when we do this in this model, we can see that we get a positive beta attached to volume, a positive value, which means that the model slopes upwards. Now, this tells us that in general, the beta attached to the predictor uh, represents the rate of change of the outcome as the predictor goes up. And also the beta zero, if we stretch the model back to where the volume of the concert is nothing, zero decibels, this gives us a prediction of how long ears will ring for when the concert is silent. We've also seen that these linear models can represent differences between groups. 
So we could have two groups of, uh, for example, people attending a concert or not attending a concert. And when we do this, we still use a straight line, we still use a linear model, but in this instance, the beta attached to the predictor variable represents the difference between the means of the two groups and the beta zero represents the mean of one of those groups, which we will come on to in future lectures. We've also seen that we can extend the model to have multiple predictors. And when we do, we just pop the predictor in like magic and we estimate a B for it as well. So any predictor that goes in gets a B attached to it. So we have to estimate a parameter for it. So let's have a look at our knight's first model. Now the knight made a, a claim that outline um, that dragons eat sheep. He said, cause they eat our sheep. Well, let's have a look at his data. So here are his data. These are the data on the sheet of paper that he waved at me. And we can see on here a cheeky little kingdom because each of these dots represents one of the kingdoms. And this kingdom, or maybe it's two that just have a similar score, I don't know, uh, is very, very different to the others. So the number of dragons in this kingdom was nine, but the livestock killed per week was huge. It was over 70. And when you compare it to all the other kingdoms, this seems like a very kind of unusual value. This is what's known as an outlier. So this is a case of data that's very different from all of the others. Now these can influence your model. We can see the effect that outliers can have on a model if we have a look at what happens if we magically remove this outlier. The model changes, the line changes. It gets much, much flatter. Let's look at that again. So when the outlier's in, the line slopes upwards. So we would get a value of a, a beta attached to the number of dragons attached to the predictor variable that was slightly positive. But when the outlier goes, oh, the line changes. It becomes very, very flat. So that outlier is kind of dragging the model up in the air like that. It's dragging it up. So it's influencing it. It's what's known as an influential case. Now, we have to be very careful about influential cases because as you can see, they affect the estimates of the Bs. When the outlier's in, we get a positive B. When the outlier's removed, we get a kind of a, a basically a close to zero B. So how do we detect these kinds of cases? Well, we've just looked at one way of detecting them, which is to look at a scatter plot. You could also look at histograms, but I think scatter plots are often a bit clearer. There's something known as a standardized residual. Now the residual is the difference between what the model predicts and the score you observe. So looking back here at our outlier, the residual is this difference here, the difference between what's predicted by the model and what we actually observed. And you can see when you have an outlier, these distances are very big because by definition they're an outlier. However, sometimes cases are so influential that they drag the model towards them so much that actually their residuals are not particularly big. So this is not a foolproof way to detect outliers, but it can be a useful diagnostic tool. And we can look generally as well. If we calculate the residual for every single data point and we convert them to Z scores, so we standardize them, then what we should find is that about 95% of these standardized residuals should fall between plus or minus two. It's actually 1.96, 1, uh, 1 but two will do. And about 99% of them should lie between 2.5. So we can do some general checks of is the amount of residuals falling between um, two and two point, uh, plus or minus two and plus or minus 2.5 about what we'd expect. But in terms of influence, one kind of quick way to look for influential cases is to use Cook's distance. So this measures the influence of a single case on the model as a whole. So how much a single case influences the parameter estimates, the values of B that we get. And if the absolute value of Cook's dis distance is greater than one, this is a case that we should have a look at as a kind of rule of thumb. And 
we can also look at the actual changes that we get in the betas. This is known as the DF beta statistic. So this is how, actually how much beta changes when a particular case is removed. So you can work this out for every single case and just see how the beta changes if that case is removed. And again here, if we you can get standardized versions of this statistic and we will be wary of ones that have absolute values greater than one. So that when we ignore the plus and minus sign, the values greater than one, that's cause for concern. Now in R, we can actually get a plot of Cook's distance, which looks, uh, well, a pretty version of the plot looks something like this. And what we're looking for is cases that have large Cook's distances. So in our data here, we have two cases, Kingdom 11 and Kingdom 48, that have very large Cook's distances, much, much larger than all the other kingdoms. If we look at the value for Cook's distance for these, it's 0.6, it's not actually at one. So this does suggest that using that criterion, these are not actually influential cases. However, um, given how, how much bigger the Cook's distance is relative to all the other kingdoms, we probably would want to take a look. So this is the model fitted for all of the kingdoms. So what we can see here is that the beta, the parameter, for the number of dragons in the kingdom as a predictor of the livestock eaten is 1.38. So that means for every extra dragon in the kingdom, 1.38 more uh, sheep are eaten. And we can see that this is a significant effect. So, uh, you know, that's what the knight was basing his conclusion on. It does look like as the number of dragons increases in the kingdom, so does the number of sheep being eaten. However, if we remove the outliers, now you shouldn't ordinarily just remove outliers for the sake of it. I mean, you could remove outliers if it turns out they're not from the population that you're interested in. So maybe it turns out in those two kingdoms, it, it's not actually dragons that were, when they were counting the dragons, it's not actually dragons. Maybe it's a pink river hippo dressed as a dragon who's eating all of the sheep. But most of the time you can't really exclude outliers. But when we remove those cases, you can see it has a dramatic effect. So the beta for dragons, like we saw on the diagram, it goes very close to zero. The line flattens, becomes 0 0.31. And now this is not a significant effect. Now, like I said, you can't remove outliers unless there's good evidence that these are cases that don't belong to your population of interest. But what you can do is fit a robust version of the model that is kind of resistant to these influential cases. So if we fit our ordinary least squares model, so our sort of typical linear model that we would be dealing with, we've seen this output before, we get a beta of 1.38, which is significant. But if we use a robust estimation method, so we don't use least squares estimation, we use a method of estimation that is relatively insensitive to influential cases, we get values that are, so this is not, this hasn't excluded the influential cases, it's just used an estimation method that is resistant to their influence. And you can see that we get a parameter estimate that's very similar to if we excluded those cases, it's about 0.3. And this is again non-significant. So it does, it suggests to me that had the knight inspected his data properly, he would have found basically no relationship between the number of dragons in the kingdom and um, and um, how many how many livestock are eaten. Well, I think I might just have done. Let me go and see that knight again. So it seems when you inspect your data properly and you fit models that are not influenced by outliers or influential cases, there isn't a relationship or there's a, a basically a zero relationship between the number of dragons in a kingdom and how many sheep are eaten. So can you leave the dragons alone, please? Well, our knight seems unconvinced. Maybe I should look at his other models. So he also said that dragons 
kidnap the princesses or kidnap royalty. Now let's have a look at the data that he used to draw that conclusion. So first of all, he showed us a model that looked at whether the number of dragons in the kingdom predicted the number of royals that went missing. And <clears throat> what you can see here is a parameter estimate of 0.12. So for every extra dragon in the kingdom, about 0.12 of a member of, the, of a royal family gets kidnapped which I'd say is a pretty small effect, but anyway, it is significant, which is probably what he's basing his conclusion on. Now, this is what his data look like. This is what he waved at us on that piece of paper. So it does look like there's a slightly positive relationship there. More dragons in the area, more numbers of missing royalty. Now he also had some other data, which he didn't wave at us, but I did find it under his tunic. And this is looking at kingdoms that have dragons versus kingdoms that don't have dragons. So just two groups of kingdoms. And what it seems to suggest is when you predict the number of missing royalty from uh, these data, you again find a significant relationship between the two. And what that's going to be reflecting is this difference between group means. So there are appear to be significantly more royals go missing when there are dragons than when there are not dragons. And the beta there is 1.21. So it suggests that about one extra royal goes missing in kingdoms that have dragons than kingdoms that don't. Anyway, let's delve into this a little bit. I wonder whether that knight has tested the assumptions of his models. So we'll have a look at some of these assumptions. The first assumption is linearity and additivity. Then we need to think about something called spherical errors. Now what this means is the population model should have something called homoscedastic errors. And to test this, we have a look at the residuals in the model. We'll go through this in due course. And also the population model should have independent errors. And again, we can inspect the model residuals to look at this. There's also an assumption of normality of something or other. And uh, two things that normality affects or is uh, relevant to, one is the population model errors and the other is the sampling distribution that we use to get confidence intervals and significance tests. So linearity and additivity, this is the most important assumption because it basically means, am I fitting the appropriate model? So linearity means that the relationship between a predictor and outcome should, in reality, be linear. So it should be the case that there's a linear increase in royalty going, oh, sorry, or decrease, a linear change in the number of royals going missing as uh, the amount of dragons in a kingdom changes. You can have relationships that are curvy linear rather than linear. And if you have one of those relationships, you shouldn't be fitting a linear model. You should fit a curvy linear one. So that's what linearity is all about. And we can use plots to have a look at whether our relationship is in fact linear. Uh, the additivity thing means that when we have several predictors in the model, we are assuming that the combined effect of those predictors is additive. So you know, the effect that one predictor has kind of adds on to the effect that another one has. Because again, if that's not the case, we're fitting the wrong model. Now, before we get into uh, spherical errors, we have to talk a little bit about the difference between errors and residuals. And um, basically, this relates to the fact that we are using samples to try to estimate things in a population. So when we talk about a model's error, the term error refers to the difference between the predictive values and observed values of the outcome variable in the population model. So these are values that cannot be observed. We don't have access to the population model in general. So when we talk about model errors, these are unobservable things. What we can observe are residuals and the term residual refers to the difference between the predictive value and observed value in the sample model, so in the data we've actually collected. So error and residual, they're two different terms. Errors refer to the population and residuals refer to the model in our sample. 
So residuals can be observed and we can assume that they are representative of the population errors. Now, you'll see why this is important in a minute. So imagine we have access to our population model, which of course we never have. We've seen this diagram before. This is the example of ears ringing um, predicted from the volume of a concert. We're imagining this is the entire population of people that have been to concerts and, uh, and have had ears ring. So this is the kind of mystical statistical unicorn that we're trying to access, but that we can't directly access. If we just kind of close in or a close up on a little bit of this population model, you can see that if we had access to the population, we would see uh, lots of kind of dots representing data and they would all be floating around the population model, which is the line. And we could, if we had access to the population, which we don't, we could have a look at how uh, much uh, how actual values differ from predicted values. So for a given case, what value is predicted by the model, what's, what's their sort of value on the line versus what's the value that they actually have. So this difference is what's known as an error. And if a dot is sitting on the line, the error will be zero. So when we talk about model errors, we're talking about the population. But like I said, these, are, these errors are not observable. We can't observe them. We don't have access to the population. But if we could, we would expect them to have certain properties. And the assumptions that I'm talking about now relate to population errors. So these non-observable things. One of the assumptions, it's not so much an assumption, but it's an expectation, is that these errors are normally distributed. So if we were to collect together the values of all those errors and put them into a distribution, it would be roughly normal. However, like I said, we can't do that. We don't have access to the population model. What we do have access to is a sample. So notice this is now a sample of the population data. So there's many fewer data points. We've fitted a model to that. We've estimated the parameters from the population, but these are all Thing, uh, these are all data points that we have actually observed. So in the sample, we can actually calculate the difference between the observed score and what's predicted by the model. We can actually look at a distribution of those. We can actually plot it as a histogram because it's based on a smaller sample. The histogram might be a bit, uh, you know, kind of blobbier and less normal looking, but we, we can directly have a look at that. So these differences between what's predicted by the model and what's observed when it's in the, the sample data are known as residuals. So residuals are indicative of population errors. So even though the assumptions are about the population model, we use the residuals in the sample model to try to test whether those assumptions are met. So spherical errors, errors should be independent. So the population error in prediction for one case should not be related to the population um, to the error in prediction for another case. This is known as, well, when they are related, it's known as autocorrelation. Um, if you have independent observations, so in our case, we've got different kingdoms, what we are basically assuming is that those kingdoms don't affect each other, which is maybe a rash assumption. Um, we can have a look at whether we think there might be a correlation in errors by an inspecting the sample residuals. Population errors should also be homoscedastic. Now, what this means is the spread of errors or the variance in population errors should be consistent at different values of the predictor variable. We'll look at examples of this in a minute. Again, because we can't observe the population errors, we inspect the sample residuals because the sample residuals should basically uh, be representative of the population errors. If we violate this assumption, then it means that the Bs that are estimated are unbiased, so they're kind of okay, but they're not optimal. There are better ways that we could estimate them than using uh, least, squares, least squared estimation. The other thing is when the, these assumptions are not met, the standard error associated with the betas will be incorrect. Therefore, any significance tests and confidence intervals will also be incorrect. So violating this assumption affects the standard error. 
So we can inspect this by looking at plots like this. So on the top left, we've got a plot of um, fitted values versus residuals. And you can hopefully see it's a fairly random scattering of dots. And there's a line going through the middle that is fairly flat. So this is representative of uh, when the assumptions are met. Heteroscedasticity which is a violation of homoscedasticity, is shown by a kind of funneling shape. So I'm just going to overlay some shapes on here. So it's shown by a sort of funneling shape where the spread of the residuals is kind of um, narrower at some points along the x-axis than other points. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be this exact shape here. You could also have funneling that goes the other way, like that. And you can also have funneling like with that sort of shape. So they spread out a lot in the middle and get narrower at the extremes. The main thing is there's not a consistent spread. Whereas over here, hopefully you can see the, the spread of residuals is fairly consistent. You don't get this kind of funneling shape. We talked about linearity. Non-linearity also shows up in these plots by a kind of banana shape. So if you have a non-linear relationship, you might see something like this in your residual plot. So it looks like a, a boomerang or a banana. Again, it doesn't have to be, uh, on this diagram, it looks a bit like a smiley face. It can look like a sad face, it could be the other way around. And if you violated linearity and homoscedasticity, then you'll get something that looks like this thing. So it's not only got a kind of funnel shape to it, it's also got curvature as well. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, a, <coughs> a boomerang that is wider at one end than the other. So this is an example where uh, of one of these plots where homoscedasticity is met. So the line is flat along the middle and the dots look like they're kind of fairly consistently spread out. So the, the spread of these dots is fairly similar as we move along. So the lines I'm drawing are all sort of the same length. In the dragon data, we have a slightly different pattern. So um, it may not be that obvious, but if I overlay these, hopefully you can see that for our um, dragon data, we've got a kind of funneling shape, whereas um, you know, in data that meets the assumption, we would not have this funnel. What about when we're just looking at our two, uh, our two collections of kingdoms, so those with dragons and those without, so we're looking at kind of two groups. The plots look kind of different because you, if it's just two groups you're comparing, then you just end up with kind of two uh, vertical lines of dots. So we've got one line of dots over here, one line of dots over here. These are our actual dragon data. And uh, again, the, the, the line down the middle now is not as flat as it was. So that's a clue to begin with that we might have a problem. But let's now overlay some arrows that look at the distances between, uh, or like the range of values for those two columns of dots. When homoscedasticity is a viable assumption, then basically those those two arrows should be the same length. So the sort of spread of dots should be roughly the same. But you can see for our dragon data that in one of the kingdoms, the spread of dots is a lot smaller than in the other one. So the, the kind of arrow is shorter for one of the kingdoms than the other. That's what we're, if we see that, we know we've potentially got a problem. So we have got a problem for these dragon data. Heteroscedasticity is hard to say If you get it you'll hope that it goes away Or perhaps that syphilis is hard to tell But syphilis won't leave you in statistics hell If your residuals are funneling out Better get ready to scream and shout Cause if your data are heteroscedastic Your model is a lousy fit Now you may come across uh, in some papers that you read or whatever something called Levine's test You might hear about it but whatever you do don't use it If you think about what you know about sample sizes and significance, it will become clear why you shouldn't. So Levine's test is a significance test of whether this assumption is met. So basically, if it's significant, it means that your residuals have significant uh, variability 
um, across the, the range of the predictor. The thing is, in big samples, what this means is you'll get significant Levine's test. And in big samples, that's when this assumption probably matters the least. And in small samples, uh, you won't have enough power to detect violations of the assumption. So basically, it's just a bad idea. Don't use it. And if you don't believe me, believe the baby of statistics. <laughs> Levine's test. I'm going on the dragon plants. What I saw by my side, dragons. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, I'm running out of time, I'm running out of time. Okay, let's look at the last uh, set of data that the knight had. So the knight says that they should kill the dragons because their dung doesn't help their crops to grow. Well, let's have a look at whether the assumptions are met for these data. Now, one of the assumptions that I mentioned before is normally distributed something or other. Now, people usually falsely think that this relates to the data. So they think that the data or maybe the population itself needs to be normally distributed. That's not what the assumption is about. So the first thing, the thing I've already mentioned is that um, there's an expectation that the model errors, so the population errors, will be normally distributed. But actually, this doesn't matter. When those errors are not normally distributed, it's been shown that your parameter estimates will be unbiased and optimal. And by that, it means it will, it will minimize the sum of squared errors. What it does mean is there may be different ways of estimating the parameters that will be more accurate. What matters a lot more is normality of the sampling distribution. So this means that um, when we discussed before, about significance testing and about confidence intervals, we saw that that process, or both those processes are based on the standard error. And the standard error is calculated based on the uh, assumption that the distribution is normal, the sampling distribution is normal. So if it's not normal, the standard error is gonna be wrong, essentially. So um, if the sampling distribution is not normal, then it means the standard error is incorrect which means that the confidence intervals will be incorrect and means that the significance tests will be incorrect because both of those things are based on the standard error. So just to remind you what a normal distribution looks like, it looks like this. So this is what we're assuming. But there's a handy thing called the central limit theorem, which we touched on briefly in a previous lecture. And what the central limit theorem tells us in this context is that no matter what the population looks like, no matter what the population looks like that you're sampling from, if your samples are big enough, then your, your, the sampling distribution of the estimates that you're uh, calculating will be normal. Uh, so what this diagram shows is uh, a kind of empirical illustration of what happens. So in sample sizes of five, let's say you were um, kind of taking samples and calculating the mean, uh, in this case, number of friends, you can see the, the population distribution of number of friends is highly, highly skewed and weird. It's not normal at all. But if we take samples from it and calculate the mean and then take another sample, calculate the mean, take another sample and calculate the mean, and we plot the distribution of those estimates across samples, even when those sample sizes are five, like here, the distribution is already looking a lot more normal than the population. It's fairly normal. When you get up to sample sizes of 30, the distribution is normal and theoretically this is this is the limit theoretically samples of 30 or more should have normal sampling distributions uh, should yield normal sampling distributions um, in practice that's not always the case but you can see again if we raise the number of uh, the sample size up to say 100 we're getting another nice normal distribution now in practice it has been shown that you might need samples as big as 160 to guarantee that the sampling distribution is normal, but theoretically at least um, a sample size of more than 30 is enough. So this is handy because it basically tells us that we can ignore this assumption of normality as long as our sample size is big enough. So 
We can look at model errors to check their distribution, even though this doesn't particularly matter. Um, but if they're not normal, we might choose to use an, an estimation method that's not least squares by looking at something called a PP or a QQ plot. In terms of sampling distribution, we just don't need to worry if our samples are large. We only need to worry if our samples are small. And we can use um, something called a bootstrap in our uh, in small samples, which is a, another way to estimate the standard error that doesn't assume normality. Just like with heteroscedasticity, there is a test of normality called the Komogorov Smirnov test, which you will possibly hear about or come across. Don't use it. Again, exactly the same uh, issues as with Levine's test. If your sample size is large, it's going gonna, it's gonna to say that really, really tiny deviations from normality are significant. And uh, in large samples, you don't need to worry about normality, so it's kind of giving you the wrong message. And in small samples, it won't have any power to detect differences from normality. So in the situation where normality might matter the most, uh, this test is gonna tell you that it's not a problem. And when it matters the least, this test could tell you that it is a problem. So it's not really very useful. If you don't believe me, believe the cat of statistics. Shall we test normality with a KS test? <laughs> So looking at a QQ plot, um, this is what normal residuals should look like. They basically will just all kind of hug tightly to that diagonal line. In our dragon data, this is what they look like. And these are very non-normal uh, residuals. So you can see that at the two ends, uh, the um, residuals are kind of curving away from um, from that diagonal line. So basically deviations from the diagonal are representative of non-normal residuals. So we might want to consider a different estimation method. If you're feeling distressed because your date is a mess and you're going as mad as a hatter because you really want me to reflect reality that's when normality matters When you've been up for days in a statistical haze You're tired and emotionally shattered You don't want to be fooled by your confidence in triples That's when normality matters If your life has got skew and you're wondering what to do Cause you feel like your brain has been battered if your sample is small, then remember the rule That's when normality matters If the scores you collect are distributional wrecks Remember, this doesn't matter Cause for C, I's and P's you need normality Of the sampling distribution of the parameter Okay, so how do we correct for these problems? Well, it's actually reasonably straightforward. We've got a few options. The first is in small samples, we can use uh, something called the bootstrap. And this is a method for uh, deriving standard errors empirically from your data rather than using kind of normal theory. So this res results in robust confidence intervals and p-values. And it's like I said, it's designed for small samples. So I'll have a look at what the bootstrap is in a minute. You can also, there's um, a family of methods for um, computing standard errors that are heteroscedasticity consistent. In other words, they give you unbiased estimates even in the face of heteroscedasticity. So if heteroscedasticity is your problem, then um, you can use one of these family of, of estimators. They're all based on something called a sandwich estimator. And there are two common methods, HC3 and HC4. Uh, so use one of those. Imagine you have a sample of scores 1, 2, 2, 4 and 10 with a mean of 3.8 and you want to bootstrap the mean. You need the bootstrap hippo. The bootstrap hippo likes to eat your data. So he goes in and he picks out a 2, but he puts it back so he could pick that value again. Then he picks out a 2 again. He puts that value back and then he samples another one. 
This time he comes out with a 10, puts it back. Has a rummage around. Picks out a 4. Puts that back. So that could be sampled again, and it is. He's picked the 4 again. So we have a bootstrap sample containing the same number of scores as the original sample, but different values because each value could be sampled more than once. On his second bootstrap sample, he picks a 2 first time round. He goes in again. He gets a 10. Oh, what's he going to get this time? He has a good rummage. Well done, bootstrap hippo. Number one. He's come out with a one. Pops that back. Now he wants another one. He's picked a two this time, and he's going in for his last one, because remember the sample has to be as big as the original sample. His final score is another 10. Another 10, and that's got a mean of five. He's going to go for a third bootstrap sample. Again, he's going to want five scores taken from the original data. He has a good rummage, sees what he likes. Oh, he's got a four. He's got a four. He's putting it back. But he's going to go in for more. Oh, what's this going to be? The suspense, the suspense. It's a one. He's picked a one. Pops it back in. Now he's going to go back for more. He's insatiable, this hippo. He's found a four again. And now... A four again. He loves that four this time round. And his final value for this bootstrap sample is going to be... He's thinking about going in. There he is. He's gone in. He's gone for a two. So the final sample has a mean of three. Now the bootstrap hippo will carry on and on and on, taking more and more bootstrap samples. But the thing to note is that each bootstrap sample is the same size as the original sample, but it has different scores because each score can potentially be sampled multiple times. And the parameter we're estimating, in this case the mean, is also different across each of the bootstrap samples. In the first one it's 4.4, in the second one it's 5, in the third one it's 3. And what we can do is if we take enough of these bootstrap samples, like thousands of them, we can look at the distribution of those bootstrap estimates. So what is the bootstrap? So here's our data, um, or uh, so this is the, the crop yield based on how many dragons there are in each kingdom, and it has a mean of 23.03. Now a bootstrap sample is a sample of scores where the scores are sampled from the original data so each um, you take one score from the original data and then you put it back in and then you take another score and then you put that score back in and then you take another one so it's possible to sample the same score more than once so for example in bootstrap sample one we've got the same number of scores that we have in the original sample but notice the scores are slightly different that's because for example a score of seven has been sampled nine times, whereas in the original data there's only five of them, which illustrates the fact that each time you're putting the score back and it could be chosen again. So this gives a mean of 21.12, which is slightly different from our sample mean. We could do the same process again, so we just take a score from the original sample, kind of note it down and then put it back, take another one, note it down, put it back, and end up with a second bootstrap sample which notice, again, it's got the same number of scores as the original sample, but the scores are different. Um, and they're also different from the first bootstrap sample, and that gives us a mean of 17.88. So each bootstrap sample is giving us a different estimate. Now what happens if we do this lots and lots and lots of times? So we take a bootstrap sample, cap estimate our parameter, so let's say the mean, and then we do another one, estimate the parameter, do another one, estimate the parameter, and we do that say a thousand times. What you can do is build up a distribution of bootstrap sample estimates. So this is us taking lots and lots of samples and each time we're noting down the value of the estimate in the bootstrap sample. And you can see that over kind of a thousand samples or so, what you would end up with is a distribution of estimates from your bootstrap samples. And what you do is you use this distribution to, to estimate the standard error. So you take this distribution and work out what the kind of standard deviation of it is and say, well, that's 
that's what the standard error is. So that's broadly what the process involves. So like I said, you'd end up with something like this. So a distribution of bootstrap sample estimates and you assume that this is what your sampling distribution looks like. So you, you then can use this to work out what the standard error would be. And this has been shown to be kind of a, a robust method for um, estimating standard errors when you can't assume normality. Oh no, 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 I must, I must hurry up. I need to hurry up, I need to hurry up, I need to hurry up. Okay, so do dragons really kidnap royalty? Well, this is the model we had originally and it looked suspiciously like they did, even though the effect was quite small. But when we fit a robust model, when we use, remember there was heteroscedasticity in these, these data, when we use a robust method of estimating the standard error, well, we see a different picture. The estimate itself doesn't change because we're not changing that. We're, what we are changing is how we estimate the standard error. So that has changed. And with this robust estimate of the standard error, we suddenly find that this effect is non-significant. So as well as having quite a small effect in the first place, because the parameter is only 0.116, so as your number of dragons increases by one, there's only... Uh, you know, 0.1 of a royal person extra that's kidnapped. So it's a very small effect, but it's also now non-significant. So it seems like dragons really don't kidnap royalty. There's not uh, a meaningful kind of relationship there. Now, what about when we looked at whether there were dragons in the kingdom or not? So we're still predicting uh, whether royalty were kidnapped or how many royalty were kidnapped, but this is just based on kingdoms where there were no dragons compared to kingdoms where there were dragons. And again, when we fit the model originally, we found that in kingdoms with dragons, about one, well, 1 1.2, but so, you know, roughly one, let's assume they didn't kidnap 0.2 of a, of a royal person. So about one extra member of royalty was kidnapped when there were dragons in a kingdom compared to when there was not. And this was significant. But again, if we use these robust standard errors, our estimate doesn't change but the standard error does. And with this robust standard error, we now have a non-significant effect. So again, it looks like when we fit a robust version of the model, our, our significance flips to the other side. But again, also, you know, the effect's not that big to begin with, really. What about whether dragon poo kills crops or, you know, stops crops from growing? Well, again, we had an original model here, which um, seemed to suggest seems to suggest that there is a non-significant relationship between the amount of poop produced by dragons and the crop yield. But when we fit a bootstrap model, because this was quite a small sample, and remember we were slightly worried about normality in this case, um, when we fit a, a bootstrap model, we get, again, a different picture. So in the robust model, it looks like poop does significantly predict crop yield. I'm just saying the dragon. Well, I think I might have done because it does look like when you look at the models properly and when you fit robust versions of the models and you deal with and actually inspect the assumptions of the model, it looks like when you have more dragons, you do get significantly more crop yield. It looks like there's not significant relationships between the number of dragons and how many royalty are kidnapped. And also, it doesn't look like there's a significant relationship between how many dragons there are in a kingdom and how many livestock get eaten. So I think, I think the knight has no reason to kill any of the dragons. So I'm not allowed to kill dragons? No, you're not allowed to kill dragons. What can I kill? You're not allowed to kill anything. Choose love. I'm going to kill you! What? No! No, 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 no! No! Zap! One zap! 
And so it was that Melvin, the great wizard of the 134 kingdoms, saved the dragons with the power of statistics.